please be seated. I set the bulletin up before I went on vacation, not realizing that today is the one year anniversary of the death of Michael Brown, not more than 15, 20 minutes away from us. And the world has been changed dramatically because of that tragedy. And there's people on all sides of the whole thing. It's brought a light to the fact that racism is still prevalent, that privilege is still something we don't realize we have. And we have a lot of work to do to bring unity and love in our community. I'm not going to get into who was wrong, who was right, and I'm not going to do any of that other than I feel an important need that we need to pray today. So before we begin the sermon, I want to just take a moment and have a word of prayer with you. Let's pray. Holy God, from the beginning of creation, your heart's desire was that your children could live in peace with one another and that we could work that your shalom, your wholeness, your desire for the world could be. And God, we have racism and violence and suspicion and all the walls that we put up to separate us from each other. And it seems like they're so strong and so hard to break down. We pause now, O oh God, and we lift up the family of Michael Brown, the family of all who have lost loved ones, especially their children, O oh God, through violence, through wrong assumptions, through all the things that tear us apart. We pray, O oh God, for your healing grace to flood this city. And we pray, O oh God, for your justice and righteousness to flood and surround the city. We pray that our eyes are open, that we might look at one another, honoring you within each of us. And we pray, O oh God, that we find the way to work together so that we can be your one holy loving, serving family. Do a miracle in our city and in our lives, O oh God. And we pray that everything we do brings honor and glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. When I was in college, so you don't have to do the math, it was about, well, several decades ago. There was this family at the church that I found. And it started off with just Judy and Earl and they had hopes to have a child and they were successful in conceiving their first child. And Judy worked in a preschool and, and she worked with all these kids and it was just the time when German measles or rubella was starting to become prevalent in the world. And there was a little child who had that that was coming to the preschool that no one knew about and Judy got very ill. Very ill that she was taken to the hospital. She spent a while in the hospital and this was just probably back in the early 70s just to date it so get the perspective of what the world was. The doctor, her obstetrician said we can tell that the baby's head is abnormally large because of this exposure. We don't think the baby would ever really survive birth. We don't think the baby would, if it did, would even be able to hold its head up. And we think you should terminate this baby. And her husband wasn't present. And so she said, well, I can't tell him. You'll have to tell him. So he went on the way to tell her husband and then he got called into an emergency and he never saw the husband who was waiting in the waiting room. And eventually the husband said, well, I'm just going to go check on her because the doctor hasn't come and I'll just check. And when he got up there, he started talking to her and he didn't mention what the doctor had told her. And so she thought, well, we're not going to talk about this. 
and they continued on with pregnancy. I still question how that didn't happen, but that's their story. The baby was born, and it was a challenging birth. The head was a bit larger, but not as large as they had projected, and she was not deformed or disabled. Matter of fact, when she went to college, she got a full ride at Stanford. But because of proceeding with the pregnancy, Judy could never have any more children, and she had always dreamed of having a lot of children. And so all of a sudden, somehow, someone found this African-American little girl who was severely disabled. And she was in the foster system, and no one would take this child. And somehow, someone came to Judy and Earl and said, would you be willing to adopt this child? And they went, sure. And it got to be out that this was a couple that would take children that no one could find a home for. And so the time I got to college, they had six children, five of them adopted and one that was their biological, most of them African-American, but some different ethnic backgrounds. And all of them had had a brutal life before they came to Earl and Judy. And they weren't the perfect family, like no family is, but they worked together. Their dining room table was this really long picnic bench. Not fancy, not formal, but everybody sat at it. And when somebody had a homework problem, one of the older siblings helped, or one of the younger siblings helped the older si sibling who couldn't get the map. They worked together. When someone had to bring empanadas for the Spanish class, the whole family was in the kitchen and they made empanadas together. They were probably, when I look back at it, the, the sense of family that has formed some of the family decisions I've made in my life. They demonstrated that thing that all of us kind of hunger for, and that is to be a family, to be part of a community, to have that sense of belonging, uh, to have that sense of being in relationship with others. You know, we get that feeling when we watch those TV shows where everybody has the Sunday night dinner and they're all sitting around the table and they're all having pleasant conversations. And of course, on TV, no one ever bickers and, or argues in it. They're just kind of, they might poke a little bit, but you know, it's the, it's the community, it's the family. And our Ephesians text is talking to the people of Ephesia, Ephesus, saying, hey, Everybody has community. Everybody's trying to do good family stuff here. But as Christians, we need to somehow distinguish how we relate to one another. If we're just like everybody else in the world, then they won't know that there's anything different in our life. And so we need to not be bickering with one another. We need to not be fighting with one another. We need to not be holding grudges. And so the text comes down with here are the things we as a community as a church, need to be about. And it can feel like really oppressive. Because, you know, in families, we have our own dysfunctions, you know? So if we want to get, you know, Aunt Zelma to do something, we talk to Aunt Winnie and Aunt Carrie, who influences Aunt Zelma to do what we need. Now, I don't know if that happens in your family, but it happens in a lot of families. Or if we're angry with our sister, we tell the mom, right? And the mom has to navigate this thing with the sister. Am I making sense? We don't come up and say, you know, when you do this, I feel this way. We let mom handle it, or grandpa, or you, you know how we do it in our families. And what the, the text for the Ephesians today is saying, hey, let's stop playing that game. Let's begin to enter into truthful and honest and fully loving relationships. And if you're angry at somebody, deal with it. Don't walk around and when you're in a meeting with them, make a snide comment or poke them or whatever. Deal with it if you're in conflict. And, and don't let it get to the point where it does harm, where it makes you eaten up inside and your stomach's boiling and, and their stomach's boiling and everybody's going, what do we do? And so the text for Ephesians is basically saying, don't 
let anger get to the point where it causes damage. Now that's not to say that when we see things that are un not right, unjust, that we're not supposed to get angry about them and move forward. But the point is, is this is not, hey, you looked at me the wrong way, so I'm gonna like make your life miserable. You know what I'm saying? This is stuff where we have to say, hey, I'm hurt, we need to talk, let's heal this. If you're stealing, don't. Work for productivity. And the truth is, everybody wants to do something important with their life. Everybody wants to do something productive. Everybody wants to make each day count. But when they go to bed at night, they can look back and say, okay, there was a difference because I was here today. I did do something productive. I volunteered over here, or I went to work and I made some, something significant happen at work. But it was a useful day, it was a purposeful day, and I feel like I've accomplished something. It feels good because I've done something today. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. I think that means gossip. And of course no one here gossips. We've never done it at the job. We've never, you know what I'm saying? It's so easy to do, isn't it? Oh, did you hear? I want you to pray about this because I'm really concerned for so-and-so. They're, they're out drinking again. Does that build anything up? Well, I'm telling people to pray, so it's okay. Really? Really? I think that's one of our biggest challenges as a people, right? Gossiping. And it's like, what is it? What is it? Good is it? You know the next thing? Only say what is helpful for building up others. What if we... What if we did that? What if we got to the point where we could stop the gossip? You know, I, boy, I know something juicy and I want to... Hey, we just need to pray for our families and our church because they're being challenged. See the difference? What if we committed that the only words we say are going to be words that help and build up? I've been to a lot of funerals. And I've always heard somebody say at these funerals, that person never said an unkind word. And I'm thinking, really? 